as local food markets more and more become the part of the global market. There are many challenges for the food business today in providing food products to the world. For instance, in the state of world populations growing, where the supply of food is very limited, the question of how to maintain the food security in order to meet future needs is one of the most pressing. Furthermore, when the demand of food is expanding, how will the economic sector deal with the mass consumptions for maintaining the quality? And test of food. For the governments of many countries, the question may be one of finding the best policy and strategy for exporting the food product to the more challenging global market. Regarding to the topic of food security, we have here a saying from Dr. Molly Brown from NASA about the low global satellite observing system can play. To help the weather-sensitive agricultural industry be better prepared for the possible sudden weather changes. So here, what I did is I was discussing the impact of climate and a change and changing weather on agriculture. So we're interested in making sure that agriculture is prepared for shocks, for price changes in food prices. The price of oil and the price of commodities and the impact of a changing uh, situation in the global marketplace, since Thailand and many places in Asia export food elsewhere, that's really important. But the other major shock is environmental. What will happen when it's really wet or really cold or really dry, and how those extreme weather events will shock the agricultural system. So we can use the satellites to know not only what has happened in the past to look at trends, how things are changing, but also where we might go in the future, and to warn of the extreme events so that the agricultural system is prepared. We've developed flood forecasting models, which will help warn of extreme flood flooding events, and those systems have helped in the last year or so. In the extreme weather that you've seen um, during the rainy season, the weather forecast doesn't do you any good unless you know something extraordinary about it, and what are you going to do about it? So it's that last step. How do you take the information from the model and put it into, you know, into a risk framework which can then respond effectively to the risks? That must be done by government. It's not enough to just know it's going to rain tomorrow, right? What are you going to do with that? It's quite challenging. Besides dealing materially with the ongoing climate changes, food industrial and business enterprises have to deal on so with something less material, belonging to the hearts and attitudes of the food consumer. Plopping into the complexities of this human domain. Can provide a success or failure of a certain food product. Accordingly, many food industrial and business companies take this dimension seriously as the main way to gain an in-depth understanding of how they should do to be the winner of the business battles. A study from Thailand, which shows us the importance of using this consumer research approach in Thai food business. In order to be successful in the market, you need a consumer pool, the market they call marketing pool. So if you do not know what your consumer want, who actually pay you money, then you're not going to go anywhere in this age of the town, 21st century. In order to know and give the product that actually consumer really really love. I use the word love, not just want or like. That's what you need to do. Otherwise, you need to pay more money to make people love it, and that is going to cost more for actually the business to survive. The topic of this study was Asian and the impact of AEC. Actually, when you look through it, we have more similarities than we think. The cultural exchange happened before, and that is still remain in your food. They carry food. And culture goes through with it. 
and you see noodles, if you look at my slide, you can start to see that the country that border Vietnam, which was a huge empire called Hunan Kingdom, it actually took over half of Thailand and Myanmar in 1500 years ago, 900 years ago. And it actually got influenced by Chinese. So noodle comes from there. So in Thailand, we end up with the innovation that we actually added value into noodle is and known throughout the world is Pad Thai. It's not Thai, but it's Thai. When you study that, now you start to see the subtle differences that allow, prevent you to be too ignorant to their culture because, oh, it's noodle. We're going to sell Pad Thai, it's noodle. No. We allow you to actually improve your part, our Pad Thai, how we can make Pad Thai to suit the taste of, taste of Vietnamese, to suit the taste of Cambodian. We can also sell Pad Thai as Pad Thai but that market will remain just only the niche market. If you really want to sell something in the mass scale and make it bigger, you need to study who you want to sell to at this point because niche market will not bring economic power to Thailand. Man always belongs more or less to its own past. So the age-old traditions of any society can influence its people behaviors more or less in an unconscious way, including the behavior of eating food. As a result, a number of food traditions and cuisine can be traced back thousands of years to their origins. Some still have a significant actual power to enrich itself further. Some seem to lose its power as time passes by. However more or less their influences remain, such old age traditions await inspiring today food marketeers to market foods or culinary products in their names. In one of the most ancient societies like China, it's not hard to discern examples of business endeavors trying to be benefited from the past, both culturally and economically, such as these two examples from our forum. 也就是说,在世界上大概有20亿左右的人口是以稻米为主食的。那么在这个稻米发展的过程中，我们有很多使用稻米的方法，因为我们从考古发掘中来看，我们在中国青海的拉家遗址已经发现了四千年前的面条，这是考古发掘出来的。那在这个这个面条，就是说拉家遗址出
，呃，那么紧接着我们儒学带来的这个啊，其他啊，这个边缘性的课题呢，也随着热起来，像一呃，养生功夫菜的饮食文化的研究呢，呃，应该说，呃，也是因为儒学热而产生了这个呃大家的关注。另外呢，孔子大片的拍摄以及我们上海世博会，那么孔府菜的推出，呃，按照我这个论文哈，有三个方面，一个是博物馆运作，博物馆运作呢就是吃到能吃到非常传统的，第二部分呢是由我们这个学院派老师们，啊、呃，通过教学模式传播的一些菜品，另一部分呢，最后一部分是呃张扬的啊，按照市场。需求按照市场利润这样一个呃影响，呃，那么来展示的，呃，创新了的或者创意了的，那么衍生功夫菜这部分菜呢，呃，市场卖点比较好，呃，我们作为零点形式在博物馆的售出呢，呃，将来会是很好的一个方式，啊，让更多的或者普众这样或者大众化这样一个饮食呢，呃，能品尝到，呃，非常这个。这个这个有历非常有历史感，而且有非常高端的这样一个饮食文化的呃产品和品牌。Even if the life of Thai cuisine is much much younger in years than the Chinese, its practitioners will to assert its own identity through preserving the cuisine's authenticity or Thainess in the recipes is not harder to see. Studies show that in some cases, the success in preserving the cuisine's authenticity or in portraying its distinctive identity is one of the key elements in making a food business, especially the less long business, successful. Here are some voices from the forum trying to confirm this very fact. Until present day. Local people exposed more to international value. Mass media, social network, uh, are contributing meaning of internationalities into Thai culture, including of our food. So, Thai food is gaining more and more international concept, and you may see that Thai food, especially in the mainstream. Is hybridized between the local and international concepts. In usual Thai restaurant, they would like to construct Thainess through three main characteristics. Firstly, to the physical settings. Secondly, to the service, and lastly, to the food itself. From the first characteristic, which is the physical setting, you might see from the furniture. Decoration outside and inside, and most of all, on the table. For instance, the food which present on the plate. The plate they select are those plates that once used in the old day. It might be some restaurant that use what we call benjamin. Some restaurant use what we call siradon. Another key prominent. Which the host and the guest interact, and feeling of Thainess is the service through the staff. These boys and girls are recruited and interviewed several times in order to have the people that can join the team. They have to learn Thai food cultures. They have to learn about uh, Thai ware ceramic. Art upon table dining, and also they have to learn, which is remarkable, is how they posture inside the dining hall. Even though now when they work, they do not wear Thai costume; they wear a little bit contemporary style. But they have to walk to talk like Thai people in the old day. You know, there, there is a problem in authenticity because what I think is authentic may not necessarily be what another another Thai cook thinks is as authentic. It's such a circumstantial, such a subjective idea. What we try to do here is to use old recipes and bring them back to life, so at least have some uh, veracity, have some standards that we try and apply. Uh, 
I have grave concerns about Westerners cooking Thai food because, you know, when I see outside of Thailand, outside, you know, many cooks who are Westerners who are trying to cook Thai food, they think that sometimes a bunch of coriander and a handful of chilies makes Thai food. And it doesn't. It's a far more complicated cuisine than that. I've been playing around with this food for the last 25 years and I know how difficult it is to do. I don't. I, what I'd like to think is that we're trying to be, strive towards a Thai taste that uh, has little to do with what the international requirements might be, or what international taste expectations are, but merely does it taste Thai and provide the provide the guests with what hopefully we with what we believe hopefully is good Thai food without altering the taste, without changing the seasoning, without making it less spicy, without making it less complicated, uh, but just trying to do the right thing. But the fact we've just seen is by no means universal. The business success of some Thai restaurants comes not from guaranteeing the Thainess in the recipes. Rather, it comes from the success of adding something new into the traditional. Uh, the essence of what I'm trying to do here is, a, so it's not really progressive Thai, but uh, there are, I, I'm, I'm not stuck to one, to one aesthetic. Uh, my food isn't really dogmatic, so if I feel like changing something in a way that I think makes it better, I don't worry about what the old ladies are going to think, because that's, that's not the point. It's not authentic. Uh, but in my opinion, it's maybe a little bit better because of, or, or different. No, no, let's not say better because that's not fair. It's, uh, it's different than what everyone else is doing. I think you have to differentiate yourself. The food here I think is essentially Thai. I don't, I don't, serve, uh, I don't serve anything that would be considered a Western dish. The flavors are Thai. What you're eating is Thai food, but it's just my interpretation of Thai food. Um, I don't think that's very different than what a lot of Thais do. You know, if there's a certain Goi Tiao restaurant or a certain place that is famous for one dish, it's usually famous for that dish because they do it a little bit differently than everybody else does. Um, and that's what I do too. So sometimes I see someone on the street that's, that's cooking a dish in a different way, and the first thing I think is, that's interesting. Maybe I can do that. Not, that's not authentic. Why are they doing it that way? There's a lady that makes kamokai across the street from me and she puts raisins in the rice. It's very nice. That's a very sort of Middle Eastern thing to do, but she's Thai and she's doing it that way. And maybe that's not authentic, but it's good. By the way, some attempts to put a food product research into the business practice seem to be in vain from the very outset. Because of the somehow contradiction with the key political value of the country. So, a participant from Thailand has something to share with us concerning the dimly future of her food research, even if, in fact, it is the very potential one. Uh, fruit Y and Herbal Y is very good alternative because it contains uh, substance having functional properties such as anti-theoretical really properties. If uh, we want to develop its as export market, we have to develop its quality. It should stand out as premium grade wine quality. For the research about developing uh, Thai wine is complex in my opinion because um, the government has no policy to support this kind of research because it is beverage, uh, alcoholic beverage. So we must be aware that the political factors can have significant roles in determining the course of the food business no less than other factors. Politics is very complex in its nature and it needs the intricate studies to understand how a piece of political machinery can set the business course of a food product in the society. Here Professor Wong Park Noong from Hong Kong will tell us about the complex shapes of Thai rice business resulted mainly from a distinctive nature of Thai political culture. The Sino-Thai uh, rice trading business have been dominated uh, by ethnic Jews, right? And if you are not an ethnic Jew, it's very hard for you to go into that particular profession and business. For example, through marriage, 
or you become a relative of them or you become a very close family friend of them why is it because the way that they operate from collecting rice from rice trading to rice milling to rice di distribution and to rice exporting these are very much based on a kind of family lines or based on blood ties apart from that um, in terms of international rice trade the deal to uh, rice traders in Hong Kong, they have been making you very good use of their ethnic or family connections with those in Bangkok and Thailand so they can manage to import uh, relatively cheap and affordable and good quality jasmine rice from Thailand for us to consume, right? From what I observe from the central to the northern part of Thailand, I observe that in every town in every city you can find Sino Thai charity foundations. Now these Sino Thai charity foundations are very active organizations who were responsible of uh, during disaster times such as the frost last year or in drought or in uh, any difficult times that they will give out money and food and medical assistance to the farmer and to the people so that uh, the relationship between the traders and the meters and these, uh, the farmer majority can be maintained in a very harmonious way. I think it's very important. Whereas in the Philippines, uh, comparatively speaking, um, not every town, uh, only the big city, they have this kind of Chinese Filipino charity organizations, right? And that is also a way to explain why communist insurgency still exists in the Philippines, where it does not exist in Thailand. Because the businessmen in Thailand, they have a stronger sense, even in the smaller town, they have a stronger sense of corporate social responsibility, I have to say. Right? And that is very important because that will help the whole Thai society to keep away from social unrest and rebellions.